Hello, and welcome to another episode of Enchanting Economics in New Mexico. This podcast is a production of Bieber, the recognized expert in socioeconomic data for the state of New Mexico. Your hosts, as usual, are myself, Rayanne McKernan, alongside Sarun Lytel. This episode is part one of a series on uranium mine cleanup. Bieber researchers have been working on a project about this subject for over a year and recently presented their findings to the state's Indian Affairs Committee. Joining us today is one of the speakers from that presentation, Susan Gordon. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. So you are the coordinator for the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment. Can you tell us what that organization is and and what your guys' mission is and how you got involved in this? Sure, great, thank you. So the Multicultural Alliance for Safe Environment was formed in 2007 and it was it brought together a number of grassroots community groups located in the Grants Mineral District, which is from the Laguna and Acoma Pueblos west through um, New Mexico onto the Navajo Reservation. So these groups represent indigenous communities, um, low income communities, former uranium workers and miners. And they felt that coming together, they could um, have a stronger voice in decisions that were being made in the area and in their work together. So they founded themselves on environmental justice principles. And that has really held, you know, all these years later as um, a commitment among the groups in how we work together, but also at the way we look and analyze problems. So for the Multicultural Alliance for Safe Environment, which I'll call MASE, M-A-S-E, we work on, as I said, uranium mining issues. We're opposed to new uranium mining. We advocate for environmental cleanup and protection of our communities and the land and air and water. And we also look at the health impacts from uh, the legacy of uranium mining. So we kind of, you know, we cover Um, a wide approach. We work locally, we work with EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that oversees uranium cleanup from the federal agency perspective, and also with the New Mexico Environment Department in looking at um, the, the local agencies that have jurisdiction over what's going on. Can you tell us how some of these communities have been impacted by the legacy of unremediated uranium mines? Sure. So um, in the state of New Mexico, we have about 250 uranium mines that are on state lands. And about half of those are um, without someone who's responsible for the cleanup. So that's abandoned uranium mines. On Navajo Nation, they have over 1,100 identified uranium mine sites, and about half of those, over 500, are um, have no identified person. So they're a, ba- a company. They're abandoned uranium mines, meaning there's no one that we can go and look to and say, you need to pay for this cleanup. So those mines tend to come under Um, The Superfund program, which was set up by the federal government as a way of addressing uh, outstanding contamination. Um, And, you know, so that's kind of like, again, like the big picture. So more locally, um, in the grants area, for instance, there's a huge uranium tailings pile that is a Superfund site that's operated by the Homestake Barrett Gold Corporation. It's a big international um, corporation. They had uranium mines and they also had an operating uranium mill. And that mill um, started contaminating the local drinking water way back in 1967. So they, you know, (laughs) they informed the community they needed to stop using their wells 
For a while, they provided free drinking water to the community for 10 years, and then they stopped doing that. And just in the past two years, they've started providing free drinking water again. But Homestake has been trying to do remediation at this site for more than 40 years, and the groundwater is still contaminated. Um, there's still high levels of rad radon that are released from the tailings piles. And because they've been so unsuccessful in cleaning, um, cleaning the groundwater up, they're now in the process of buying out the landowners around their, their uh, designated boundaries in the hopes that the community will stop complaining and just go away. And then their, their plan is to try to walk away from this cleanup. Near Gallup is um, another area where there were a lot of uranium mines. And one of them um, operated by United Nuclear had a uranium tailing spill. It happened back in um, 1969 and it released over 90 million gallons of toxic waste and radioactive material. It is still the largest nuclear radiation accident in US history, though it doesn't get much attention. That spill uh, went down the Rio Puerco. It went all the way through Gallup, through several Navajo chapters and down into Sanders, um, Arizona. And there was some attempt to clean up some of the sludge shortly after that spill happened, but there's never been any studies about the health impacts. Um, the whole um, water contamination down there, I mean, there's certainly at the time uh, people lost their um, sheep and their cattle that were used to wandering in, in the, the Puerco there. Um, so no health studies. And that's, you know, that's been 41 years since that wow. spill happened. The community of Redwater Pond Road is um, a little bit further up the road. It's about 12 miles from Gallup. And um, they're surrounded by three Superfund sites. So they have been working with the EPA for about 20 years, trying to get what's called the Northeast Church Rock tailings pile moved. And they wanted that pile moved off of Navajo land. And the solution that EPA chose was to only move it a half mile down the road and stack it up on top of existing mill tailings on private land. So it's not really protecting the community the way they would like. Um, they really would like it moved far away from where they are, but they're gonna have to continue to live um, near it, near this pile. Their groundwater is contaminated. They're no longer able to um, have their gardens or their sheep or their, their cattle there. Many people have cancers and other diseases that are associated with uranium exposure. So it for, for the communities that I work with, this is longstanding um, exposures, environmental health issues, and uh, real examples of environmental injustice. Yeah, it, this is very mind blowing. Like, I, I'm not a native New Mexican, um, but I've been in the state for almost 20 years now. And um, until we started working on this at Bieber, I didn't know anything about any of this. So it's, um, I'm at a loss for words because it's just heartbreaking. It's a, yeah, it's a shocking and horrific um, situation. And under, you know, the COVID um, limitations right now, the Navajo Nation, of course, has been hit extremely hard. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Um, some of them are cultural, that people, um, Navajo families tend to live in multi-generational homes. So mm -hmm. exposures are, are passed pretty easily. But also, I think people have heard by now that at least a third of the families that live on Navajo Nation still do not have direct access to running water in their homes. 
So their ability to, you know, just do the basic wash your hands, you know, mm -hmm. to stay safe. It's not that they they don't wash their hands ever, but it's not like right. they can walk to a sink and wash their hands. You know, they have to they have to think about washing their hands compared to drinking water for the next week. Yeah. So hopefully under um, some of the CARES Act, um, they'll be able to address some of these problems on Navajo Nation and, um, you know, create some solutions that will really benefit these communities that have been so impacted. Yeah. Um, and so we haven't really publicly talked much about this project yet because, um, you know, the researchers who worked on it are still working on finalizing the official report. But um, the lead researchers from Bieber were our director, Jeff Mitchell and Rose Rohr. And both of them have spoken very highly of you and have said that the road for getting this legislation passed or for getting the study, you know, approved was quite lengthy and maybe even a little bumpy, but you have been a champion and worked on this relentlessly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your process and, and your involvement in this and, um, you know, how you've managed to keep going? Well, thank you. <laughs> So um, one of my, uh, I'm a consultant for MACE, and one of my um, tasks and responsibility is to represent the communities um, during the legislative session. And we have worked on some memorials in the past around the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, uh, which is a bill that we're in the US Congress, we're trying to get amended and expanded in order to cover more um, uranium workers and downwind communities. And so in talking to legislators at the, um, at the Roundhouse, there is a lot of skepticism about the health impacts um, from radiation. Um, and a lot of, you know, wishful thinking that uranium mining would come back because at the time that uranium mining was happening, it was good paying jobs. Um, the indigenous community who was um, very involved in the actual mining, the underground mining, was never really told of what the, the health risks were. Um, so their perspective about uranium mining is one of you know, the consequences to their family and their, their health about, and their water um, that this was not a good thing, and they don't, for the most part, want to see uranium mining returning. In other communities, especially folks in, in the Grants and Milan area, they remember those good jobs and they would like to see them come back, and they think that they're going to come back, and they keep advocating for more uranium mining as a, a way to address the severe economic situation that they're in there because once the mines left, so did all the good jobs, the stores closed. So there, there's kind of this myth, I call it, that um, all things about uranium mining were good and we need it back because we need jobs and income in the state of New Mexico. So it, w it was that sort of response that got me thinking that, you know, really uranium mining is not going to come back. The international market for uranium mining has the cost per ton, you know, profit at around between $22 and $30 a ton. Mm -hmm. When the uranium mining stopped in the U.S., which was in the late 1980s, they weren't making money at $70 a ton. That was the 1980s. I mean, the, the profit margin is, it's just not feasible for uranium mining at the level that was going on in the past to come back in the United States. Yeah. So, okay, what do we do then? And so we, we just really started thinking about the jobs that are gonna be available 
using the same skill set that uranium miners have are cleaning up these mines. And it, especially as the Navajo Nation received their first um, large Superfund settlements, I mean, they haven't, it's not like the money went in their pocket. EPA is holding the money, but it was 1.7 billion. And I want to be clear, that's a B, billion. And that's to clean up only 223 of the over 1,100 contaminated mines on their on the reservation. So that's a lot of money. And it's not really going to do a whole lot of cleanup. But that's a whole lot of work, you know, that those are jobs that we felt should be coming to New Mexicans, should be coming to impacted communities. And yet we were seeing from the very beginning that, you know, these big out-of-state corporations were coming in. They were getting these, the the beginning of the um, scoping jobs and the only jobs that were really being offered to New Mexicans and to Navajos were truck drivers and, you know, bulldoze operators. And, you know, and under the cleanup program, those pay well. So I, I don't want to, you know, imply that those are not good jobs because they are good jobs. Mm-hmm. But there's all these other jobs out there too. And how do we make sure that our communities in the state of New Mexico are going to benefit from it. So that was how, you know, we kind of came up with this study. I started talking to different folks, you know, if we wanted to do a study like this, who who could do it? Immediately, we were directed to um, Jeff Mitchell and the, the Bureau for Business and Economic Research. Um, we had a discussion. We had actually, we had several discussions we tried to figure out how much money we would need. And um, and then we went to the legislature and tried to see how we could get the money. And um, the first year, which was the last um, full session, no, I think the last 30 day session that um, Susanna Martinez was the governor, we got the bill all the way through um, to the governor's desk as a package that was earmarked for um, Native American programs. It was a million dollars and um, the governor vetoed it. So, I mean, there were projects in there, you know, like fix the well in a community or repair the bridge or, but she vetoed the whole bill. So the next session, Representative Wanda Johnson, who has been the champion um, in the legislature for us, was able to, um, you know, work through the system and get it included in the um, the House Appropriations Bill. And because it was included there, then it wasn't fought on the Senate side, and we were able to get it through. So that's, you know, it it was an effort um, talking to legislators about it. They really liked the idea of job creation and the economic development opportunities. It's not something that people had thought about before, uh, but they certainly heard the possibilities that were there. And, um, you know, sometimes they voted against us, but it, it was, it was more the politics of what was going on in the roundhouse between Republicans and Democrats. And it didn't really matter if they thought your idea was good, if, if it was coming from a Democrat with which Representative Wanda Johnson is, then they, they voted against it. So, um, so it was, it was a challenge. Uh, we, you know, we went through the process twice. Um, but we we did secure the money thanks to her leadership, and I will be forever grateful because I think this study has really shown exactly what we thought that the the future of jobs in uranium mining is not in new mines, but in the environmental cleanup program. Well, hopefully we can um, pin Rose and Jeff down and and get part two of of this series in a couple of weeks 
and actually discuss what those findings from the study were. Um, so you don't have to go through, you know, what all the findings were. But um, being that you uh, were one of the speakers, you and Jeff, presenting to the committee, how did how do you feel the legislature received the study findings? And where do you think we go from here? You know, it, it's, it was hard because we're t- doing all these hearings um, online. And, um, you know, I, I guess some of the feedback that I got was that it was really hard to see the PowerPoint presentation and the sound wasn't that good. And I, you know, I think that as we all get more used to these Zoom meetings, we need to speak up early. If, if you can't read or hear something, you got to say yeah. something right away because, you know, why sit through a 45 minute presentation if you can't hear it? So I was a little disappointed to hear that kind of feedback, but I have to say that Senator Sharon Pinto was amazing at the end. It was so clear that she understood what this was about and that this was real possibilities um exciting possibilities to think about how to move this program forward and um i'm very hopeful that um i'll be able to do follow-up with the report once it's completed um get it out to members of the legislature um hopefully go to the governor's office um and make a presentation there because you know we, we went to the Indian Affairs Committee. That's just one committee and there's maybe 20, you know? And so we need to be able to, during the next legislative session, get this proposal uh, before a lot more eyes. And um, I, I think the great thing about the report is, you know, a lot of times these efforts come with a very large price tag. And I think Bieber was excellent in trying to line out and recognize the, the, the already excellent resources there are in the state. We already have good higher education institutions with really good, strong programs. And we just need a better way of communicating and bringing um, the existing resources together. And that's a much smaller price tag than, you know, we've got to create a whole new program from scratch. So I, I really appreciated that approach. Um, and I, I will mention the key recommendation, which was, um, you know, we need to look at environmental remediation in the state as a key industry you know, a key industry like the film industry or the spaceport or, you know, like oil and gas. So there, the future of jobs is there as the energy um, sector changes. Um, even during this downturn because of COVID, there are now lots of oil and gas wells that need to be plugged. Um, they need to, you know, that's a whole other kind of environmental remediation program. But again, the skill sets and the, the, the thinking that this is a viable industry that we can employ in our state, but also create a model that could be used by other, other states for the vast contamination that exists in our country. I, I just think is so exciting. And I, I really appreciate the work that Bieber did to produce it yeah and and as you mentioned um the study does suggest that new mexico focus on environmental remediation as an industry um how do you think the the local communities will receive that and how do you think they will be impacted by that if new mexico does decide to to do it right well, the Superfund cleanup on Navajo Nation is going forward. So either we figure out a way to make sure that 
they're hiring people from New Mexico, they're hiring people from impacted communities from the Navajo Nation, um, and figure out how our small businesses can be involved. You know, where are they going to get all the trucking trucks that they need? You know, there's there's locally owned trucking businesses. You know, there there are lots of places. They, they're going to need, you know, where are the people going to be housed? How are we going to feed them? There's just so many ways that New Mexico businesses could be engaged in providing the support for this kind of an industry, as well as the workers. I just think it's it's a no-brainer, and um, they're going to be good-paying jobs. They're going to be lifetime jobs. I mean, environmental remediation takes a really long time. It's not like you go in there and two years later you're done. You know, it's two years of looking at what the problem is, and then it's three years of or more of figuring out how can you address the problem, and then then you get the shovels in the ground. So it, it it's a long-term project that I think is nothing but a growth industry. It's, it's uh, you know it's a really good way to think think where you know people who are dig the mines and would have those skills transferable to go clean up the mines and you don't have to retrain them or minimal training is required for them to transition to this new job. So it's just a win-win in both ways. Yeah, everything about it seems like common sense, which is funny because it, you know, it, it took us to get here. But it's like, wow, yeah, why aren't we doing this? Like exactly. So, Susan, do you have anything else you want to add on the subject? So the Multicultural Alliance for Safe Environment is um, currently has five core member groups. Um, the Laguna Acoma Coalition for a Safe Environment includes community members from the Laguna and Acoma Pueblo. They work on a lot of um, uh, international indigenous rights issues. They have worked to secure sacred site status for the Mount Taylor um, Mountain, which is a sacred site for um, five of the tribes in the area, including Navajo Nation. They um, have also, um, the Laguna Pueblo, once had the largest open pit uranium mine in the world. That is the Jack Pile Mine. That mine is now a Superfund site and is going undergoing evaluation for um, cleanup in the next few years, whatever few years might mean. Um, as I mentioned about the Homestake site previously, the Blue Water Valley Downstream Alliance is the community group there that's been working to um, try to get their groundwater cleaned up and they continue to, um, to advocate for that as they have for 30 years. Also in the grants area is the post 71 Uranium Workers Committee. So at one point there was about 10,000 Uranium workers in the state of New Mexico and uh, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which was established in um, the early 1990s. It covers, um, provides compensation for uranium miners that worked in the mines before 1971, but not if you worked in the mines after 1971. The majority of the mining, the intense mining that was going on in New Mexico happened after 1971. Um, and so that reason for that cutoff is that all of the uranium before 1971 was purchased by the U.S. government for its nuclear weapons program. After that 1971, the uranium then became available for the commercial nuclear power industry. It's a very arbitrary cutoff. It's not like safety issues changed in the mines. Everything was still the same. There was the thinking that state worker compensation programs were going to be able to cover um, 
the post 71 workers, but, but that did not happen. So we're still working on trying to secure some compensation for um, the uranium workers, the downwinders near the Trinity site, which was the first nuclear weapons explosion, um, and also in the, the Marshall Islands. Um, a lot of our nuclear tests happen there and they, they've just devastated the, the Marshallese that continue to live there. And then on Navajo Nation, we have two member organizations, the Eastern Navajo Diné Against Uranium Mining, who was one of the first and earliest grassroots groups on Navajo Nation to oppose uranium mining. And then the Redwater Pond Road Community Association, which is near Church Rock and they're located near the large uranium spill and surrounded by three Superfund sites. So these are the communities that are committed to working together. Um, we come under the umbrella of the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment and our website, I'll say it and then I'll spell it, is southwesturaniumimpacts.org. So swuraniumimpacts.org. Well, Susan, thank you so much for coming on and educating us all about this. It has been so informative and I'm in awe of everything that you guys and the Beaver researchers have done to uh, bring a light to this. Um, and I look forward to having you back, hopefully soon, and in, in discussing this and the progress that has been made from it soon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and again, I really appreciate Jeff and Rose and all the work that Bieber has done to uh, produce this report. I think it's it's an important step for um, for all of New Mexico. So thank you. Yeah. Well, that about wraps it up for us here at Enchanting Economics in New Mexico. Don't forget to check us out at Bieber. That's b b e r. dot u n m. dot e d u, or on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn under at UNM Beaver. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care.